Welcome to Music 1156. Uh, due to the flooding and the canceled classes, we're going to be doing a little bit of outreach learning this week. And so this lecture is a continuation of our discussion of Gestalt theory and its applications um, to music analysis. All right, so as a reminder, Gestalt means basic form or basic shape. It's a term borrowed from psychology, and it's a theory that attempts to explain how the human mind organizes information by identifying and interpreting visual, auditory, and other perceptual information. So Gestalt theory is based in principle on this idea of totality. That's the principle that all independent components relate to some sort of a cohesive whole. You can probably imagine very quickly how this, um, how this relates to music because if, for example, you go to a concert and you're going to hear a symphony, you're going to hear a variety of different components, different elements, sounds, textures, and so forth. But you're primed to assume and to interpret all of those as being interrelated because they're all part of one cohesive piece. So there are several laws that make up Gestalt theory. Um, I'm going to go through those and then talk a little bit about how those can be mapped onto analysis of music. So the first law is the law of proximity. Here's a visualization. The law of proximity says that objects that are grouped together are perceived as, um, as being related or as being part of groups, objects that are close together, that is. And so the visualization shows that although there's sort of a random array of objects here, the ones that appear to be closest together would be perceived as sharing something in common or sharing, um, participating in a relationship. There are several different ways that this can map onto music and our understanding of musical relationships. One of those is by way of passing tones. Those sets of three notes are perceived as being related because they are moving by step up a third or down a third. Another law, another way that the law of, um, of proximity can be used to explain musical relationships is by way of the neighbor tone, or another example here. All right, so again, those notes are related by way of their proximity, and they're perceived as being part of a larger whole. All three of those notes in each case are perceived as being part of a group by their proximity. All right, so another law is the law of similarity that says that objects that exhibit similar traits, for example, size, shape, or color, are also perceptually grouped. So here's a visualization of that one. You can see that most of the blocks here are red blocks, but there are a few white blocks. Those white blocks kind of standing out by their color um, would be perceived as part of a group, right? again, having some sort of a relationship. Right, so there's several ways that this maps onto music or can be applied to our understanding of musical gestures. Um, one would be direct repetition, and another would be sequencing. All right, so the law of similarity would say that each component of that sequence is perceived as related because of its similar contour. All right, so another law borrowed from Gestalt theory is the law of closure. That is the law that states objects are perceived as whole or complete, even if they are only partially formed or presented. And so here's a visualization of that law. All right, you can see here that we have several shapes that are not fully enclosed. Sorry. Um, but even so, we would perceive these as rectangles. Um, we would perceive a relationship between all of the, the lines that are making these shapes. So again, there's several ways that this can map onto music or be applied to our, um, our interpretation of musical gestures. One of those is chordal leaps. Something like that. All right, so in this case, I'm playing pairs of notes in which there's sort of an implied background harmony or an implied underlying harmony. Um, and even though you're not getting all three notes or all four notes that would make up those harmonies, we would perceive those as being, um, those pairs of notes as being related because we interpret that there is a background harmony. There is kind of a, a background uh, chordal progression that is going on. And so we understand those notes as being related by pairs, even though in some of those cases, I'm not even playing the root of the chord. 
All right, the last law that I'm going to mention at this juncture is the law of continuity. That is the law that says objects that appear to be aligned also form part of a group. So here's a visualization of that law. All right, so there's several random blue blocks here, but you can see that some of these blocks are are closely uh, are, are closely attached in such a way that they appear to be forming lines or forming relationships. This can be mapped onto music in a variety of ways, for example, explaining relationships of notes that are part of scalar passages, or notes that are part of larger arpeggios. All right, so again, that's the law of continuity. All right, so you have several follow-up assignments here that are um, designed to help you practice your, um, your understanding and interpretation of these laws and how they can be applied to music analysis, and also giving you an opportunity to do some analysis yourself. So you'll see that um, on the top of page two in your packet, you have an example of um, applications of this theory. So what I've done here is this is a four measure passage I've gone through and identified neighbor tones, passing tones, chordal leaps, arpeggios, all different types of embellishing tones or um, non-chord tones. And then as a follow-up to that, I've sort of gone back and said, well, what's, you know, if, if each of these first three notes, for example, are related by way of the law of proximity using an upper neighbor, then what that's really about is the opening A flat. And so I've gone through and done this with the whole melody and identified a sort of a backbone melody or a, or a gestalt shape of this melody as being a descending line from five. And then I went through and I did the same thing with the harmony. I identified um, by way of my Roman numeral analysis and extended one, a measure with mostly five, and then a measure returning to one. And I said, you know, similarly by way of, um, by way of proximity, this is really just a longer one, five, one progression. So this is an example. Now you have a follow-up um, excerpt here, another four measure passage, where the first step is going to be doing a Roman numeral analysis, and the second step is going to be going through and identifying uh, notes here that are, that are critical structural notes versus notes that are embellishing as neighbor tones, passing tones, arpeggio sequences, and so forth. And then producing something that looks like this, um, showing the gestalt of that material. All right, you have a follow-up assignment that's a little more creative. On the last page of the packet, you have, um, again, a short passage. The first step is going to be to produce a Roman numeral analysis. This one's in A minor. And the second step is you have a sort of a thinly formed melody, which you're invited to embellish by way of related tones, neighbor tones, passing tones, arpeggios, and so forth, um, to expand the the, the form that's already given here. Last but not least, you have a couple of review tasks, um, identifying major and minor key signatures in different staves, and drawing, uh, producing chords based on the Roman numeral analysis and the keys that are given here. All right, so again, I understand